Hello everybody, thank you for viewing. Uh, my name is Brent Duby and this is a webinar on collecting industrial IoT sensor data through our user configurable driver. Again, my name is Brent Duby. I am an applications engineer here at Kepware. Uh, I've been with the company now for just under a year, uh, focusing on supporting customers through incoming cases uh, or any inquiries customers might have on our software and how our software can meet their requirements. So thank you again for joining. Um, I'm really excited to give this presentation today. I hope you find it useful in your future, future projects. Uh, to start, I'd like to take a second to touch on Kepware as a business for those of you who might be new to us. Kepware was established in 1995 uh, with our office in Portland, Maine. And for the last 20 or so years, we've really been focusing on developing a connectivity solution for industry. Initially in the manufacturing space, but as our product has developed, we've built solutions for other verticals, such as the oil and gas industry, building automation, the power industry, and IT and infrastructure. And we really do have a global touch with preferred distributors and preferred partners located globally. And most recently, Kepware was acquired by PTC, a traditional CAD company who has a new focus on the industrial IoT world. Kepware is going to be an integral, integral part to that solution. Let's take a look at Kepware's flagship product, KepServer EX. I'd like to start building the diagram on the right, starting with KepServer's base functionality. So KepServer offers a wide range of connectivity drivers to connect a, a wide range of disparate devices, um, whether it be a PLC, uh, another OPC server, maybe a flow computer, even databases and sensors. The topic today is going to be connecting um, IoT sensors to the platform. Once Kep Server has that data, it standardizes it and makes it available to a wide range of client interfaces, whether that would be a local connection to an HMI SCADA via one of our traditional interfaces, OPC, or to an MES or historian, a more global ERP system. We could even log to a database, more recently, we've developed solutions to bring data to more IT-centric protocols, such as MQTT or HTTP. We even built a native connector to the ThingWorks platform. In addition, KepServer has some advanced functionality through the, uh, some various plugins that we offer, whether you would like to log um, consistently to a database, or maybe link a tag value from one machine to another. We can even take some simple mathematical operations on a particular tag value or compare it to some sort of threshold to set a Boolean alarm tr true. Now that we've touched on Kepware and KepServer EX, let's move our focus now to the topic of the webinar, custom sensor connectivity to be used in the industrial IoT world. So typical uh, typical industry environments would rely on robust PLCs to control a particular process, whether that would be a Siemens PLC, an Allen-Bradley PLC, or maybe a mixture of all of those. Embedding smart sensors to this process can give you more insight into characteristics of your process. Advanced analytics platforms have been popping up on the market to uh, take action on this data to provide uh, conclusions to this data that's being acquired. However, they do typically require some data collector or aggregator to bring the data from the shop floor into these platforms. Once these platforms have this collected data, then they can help you make more, uh, the sm smarter and uh, more informed business decisions. All right, let's take a look at the user configurable driver itself and how it can help you connect to disparate devices. Again, here is a traditional use case for KepServer EX. There is a control system utilizing a popular PLC model to, to connect uh, to a particular process to both control it and to provide 
um, some feedback and some insight into that process. For that typical solution, Kep Server has native drivers to connect to the Allen Bradleys and the Siemens and the Mitsubishis of the world. However, what happens when you're trying to connect one of these uh, sensors, IoT sensors, or maybe it's a custom device that you'd like to configure to bring data to Kep Server? There's most likely not a pre-built Kep Server EX driver for something like this which is why we've developed the Yukon driver to allow users to configure custom solutions or custom connectivity to these devices in a simple way. So how are you going to determine whether or not Yukon is the right fit for your device connectivity? The first thing to do would be to uh, determine whether or not there is a device specific protocol document for that particular device. If there is, you would then investigate to see if it meets the requirements for using Yukon. Understanding the physical connection, the, the data transmission, the message length, and the message content are all important characteristics of the message to understand. The screenshot on the right depicts an example of one of these protocol documents. As you can see, one or two characters are defining the message ID. Another character defines the message status. The next 10 characters define a particular weight value being sent, followed by a unit designator, a carriage return, and finally a line feed. So this gives you a good understanding of what a particular device is going to expect at, with, with their messaging. What if there's not an available protocol document to use? The next question to ask would be, is there some sort of embedded HTTP server? or maybe a programmable interface that you could design a custom message. If that is the case, the Yukon driver might be a good use case for you. Now that we've looked into the Yukon use case, let's take a look at the driver itself, starting with solicited versus unsolicited messaging. One traditional way to interact with a particular device would be to solicit a message or a request to the device. Kep server can build a transmit message, send that over the wire to a particular device. The device would then interpret that message and respond accordingly to its protocol document or maybe a, a program that you writ you've written for it. In the example that you see, Kep server is sending a transmit message of wait to the particular device. The device is taking that, that wait command or request, responding with that same request message, wait, followed by the actual wait value contained within it. Cap server would then take that message, strip out all of the ASCII characters that is, is not meaningful, and uh, select the actual message within the device or within that message that pertains to a particular tag value. Another way to interact with a particular device would be to configure that device to send an unsolicited message on a certain interval. In the example here, we have a, a message that's streaming to Kep server on an interval of two seconds. Within that message, you have a start of message ASCII character, followed by a wait command, and then finally that wait value. Kep server would just be sitting back, opening up a UDP port to listen for that message. In fact, that's exactly what we're going to demonstrate today. Uh, we are working with a Bosch XDK device, which is going to stream a UDP message to Kep server, which is going to open up a port, port on a certain interval. In fact, that message that we're going to send is totally configurable by the user. So you have the control to program the, the message being sent and also to program Kep server to understand that message in a certain way. Here's a screenshot of the Bosch programming environment. The software came standard with the purchase of the hardware and is also included, it also includes some templates to make programming easy. Even someone without a extensive programming background was able to program this like myself. This is the actual message being uh, 
constructed within the Bosch programming environment. As you can see, the first element in the message is a message identifier, followed by a counter. Next, we have the sensor data that's being collected from the Bosch device to be sent to KEP server, starting with the accelerometer data, gyroscope data, the magnetometer data, some environmental data, including pressure, temperature, and humidity, and finally, light sensor data. It's important to note where each of these values are represented in the message. For instance, the counter of this device, the second element of the message, is going to start on the fifth byte. The reason for that is because the, the first element is a four byte element. Similarly, the light center, which is the last element in this message, is going to be represented in the last four bytes of the message. This is especially apparent when you look at the Wireshark diagram. This is the actual data stream being sent over the wire to KEP server. If you notice, the, the payload has a data length of 60 bytes, which is exactly what it's, it's expected because we're the one who actually built the message in the programming environment. Okay, so let's take a look at the Yukon configuration. How are we going to parse this message to make meaningful sense and uh, equate those to tag values? Well, what you want to do is you want to edit the transaction editor. Within the transaction editor, you can configure particular steps or commands to take on this received message. The first transaction to configure would be a read response command. This is where we're going to take the actual payload defined by the user, in this case to stop after 60 bytes, to then enter that read response into a read buffer. From there, we can update tags according to the data that's coming in. Let's take a look at the update tag command properties. Within this field, you're, you can select a partic particular tag to update from a particular data source in this case being the read buffer. You also can define the actual byte that this data is going to be contained within the message. In this case, it's the ninth byte. This is where understanding where your tag values are located in the message comes in. Okay, let's start the actual demonstration for this webinar. Um, as you can see, this is the Bosch XDK programming environment. Um, there are a few panes with this, within this user interface that I'd like to show you. The first, the first pane would be at the top left of the screen, you have the actual device view. So you can see all of the XDK devices that are actually connected to your program. Uh, you can flash the actual device right within this view. The second pane on the bottom left I'd like to share is the Project Explorer view. So this gives you insight into the actual program. You can select various pages of the program to edit. Um, this was actually a template that was included within the software to edit to make it customizable. Um, what I did here within the actual C program was that I, actually, I build the message within this programming environment. So this was the message that you saw within the presentation, um, the first element being the message ID, starting here. The next element is the counter, followed by the sensor data. A couple elements of this message that I really want to point out as we're going to use it later in this demonstration would be the counter. Again, notice that it's the second element of the message. Each of the elements are four bytes long. So if you realize the first element is going to take up the first four bytes of the message, then you can easily conclude that the second element, the counter, will start on the fifth byte. 
if you use that same methodology to the very last elements of the message, the humidity and the light center, you can conclude that the humidity data will start on the 53rd byte of the message, and the light center data will start on the 57th byte of the message. The only other thing to configure within the programming environment would be the, uh, the wireless network that we are connecting to, to pass the password and the SSID, and the IP address of the machine running CAP server. An important part when you're configuring a new connection to a disparate device using Yukon is to understand the message that's coming in to the IP address in the port that's running KEP server. So for this example, we have a UDP message being sent every second, and we can actually look at this UDP message coming in in real time to understand the message content. If you remember, our data payload was 60 bytes long, which contained the message ID, the counter, and the, uh, the, the data of the actual, from the center. If you look closer into this data, you can actually see the content of the message. The highlighted part of the message is down at the bottom of the screen. And what I'd like to point out quickly is the, the counter byte. So if you pay close attention to the actual byte that I'm highlighting in yellow currently, the current hex value is 4D. If I scroll down through the messages, you can actually see that counter increase by one on every message. Similar to that, you can see the hex values of all of the sensor data through this user interface. So let's take a look at Cap Server EX and the configuration of the Yukon driver. For those of you who are new, this is the Cap Server EX version 6 user interface. The first thing to configure when you're developing connectivity would be uh, your channel. So I am going to click here to add a new channel. This is where you're able to configure the uh, driver that you're going to use for connectivity. Kep Server has a wide range of drivers to connect to Allen Bradley, Automation Direct, GE devices, Mitsubishi, and Siemens. For this demonstration, we're going to be configuring the user configurable driver. You can name the Yukon driver whatever you'd like. I'm going to name it Yukon. Next, you configure the physical connection to the device that you're connecting to. For this example, I'm going to use the Ethernet encapsulation, which brings up the selection of the network adapter you're going to use. For this demonstration, I'm going to use my wireless network adapter. Finally, you can select the connection mode that you're going to connect with. In this case, we're going to use the unsolicited connection, where Kep Server is going to open up a port and listen for UDP messages. This port that's configured here in CapServer is the exact same port that was programmed within the Bosch XDK programming environment. Finally, select the transmission protocol, which will be UDP. Next, there's going to be some low-level parameters that I will keep to default to establish a quick connection. 
The last parameter to set within the channel properties is the unsolicited mode, which we are going to configure to be yes. Finally, KepServer gives you a channel property overview for one last look. Okay, great. The next thing to configure would be your actual device. So I will click to add a device. A device within the context of KepServer represents the actual physical device you're connecting to. You can name this device whatever you'd like. I'll name this device XDK. Again, there are going to be some low-level parameters to configure, which to establish a quick connection, I will keep to default. And finally, your device parameter overview. Great. The next thing to configure now that we have our channel and device would be the transaction editor. To get to the transaction editor, you can right-click the Yukon device profile and select the transaction editor. Great. This is where we're going to configure the actual transactions to take by the Yukon driver to bring in that, that UDP message and turn them into tag values. The first thing to do would be to right-click the XDK object to create a new tag block. You can name the tag block whatever you'd like. I will name it unsolicited. From there, you can expand to see the various transactions incorporated with that tag block. You can see the unsolicited transaction here, where we can configure various transactions or commands to that unsolicited transaction block. To add a new command or transaction, simply right-click the open pane of the transaction editor. From here, you're going to have options to insert write commands or read commands. Because we're accepting a UDP message, which is unsolicited to us, all we need to configure would be uh, our read commands, starting with a read response. We have an option to define the read response frame. There are three options for this. The first is to define the frame by some sort of known length. In our example, we know our, our message length is 60 bytes long. So for this example, I will select the frame has known length frame type. You can also configure this read response to have a, a termination character where KepServer's Yukon driver will be looking for a string of characters that define the end of the message. You may have a message that contains a data length field. This is where you would configure that as well. For this example, I'm going to use the frame has known length with a length of 60 bytes. The next thing to configure would be another read command of update tag. But before we do that, let's add some tags. Within the unsolicited tag block, right click and add a new tag. You can name the tag whatever you like. I will name this counter. You can then define the data type. In this case, it's going to be a long data type. Next, you're going to define the actual format of the data. Because we created the message and understand how the data is going to be sent over the wire, we know that it's a 32-bit Intel data type. 
Again, if you have a protocol document, this type of information would be defined within that documentation. Also, if you notice, because we chose a long data type, the data length for this particular tag is four bytes, as defined by the long data type. Let's add another tag. This tag is going to be titled Humidity with the same long data type with the same format. Again, notice that the data length is four bytes. Lastly, let's add a third tag named Light Sensor. with the long data type, with the same 32-bit you know, data format. Great, let's go back into our transaction to now update tag. Again, read commands, update tag. And now that we've added tags to this transaction editor, we, we can now see that we have those tags available to update. I'm going to start with a counter tag. We're going to update this tag from the read buffer. Remember when we, we edited the, when we added a read response command, we took that payload and placed it into a read buffer. So we're going to update the, the counter tag from the read buffer starting on a particular byte, which we know from our program and also what we saw in Wireshark to be the fifth byte of the message. One thing to note too, we're starting, this data starts on the fifth byte and because we define the, the data length within the uh, create tag editor, we know that that data is going to contain contained within the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth byte of the message. Next, next I'm going to update the second tag. Read commands, update tag. I will select the humidity tag. And again, because we have built the message and have uh, reviewed it within Wireshark, we know that the humidity value is located starting on the 53rd byte of the message. Lastly, I will update the third tag, which was our light center, from the read buffer, starting on the 57th byte of the message. Select OK. All that's left to do is to update the server through this icon within the transaction editor. From here, Kept Server is going to automatically generate these tags that was created within the transaction editor. You can see we have our counter tag, our humidity tag, and our light center tag. By using Kept Server's internal test tool, Quick Client, you can gain insight into the actual tag values. The first tag that we have is the counter. You can see that the counter value is incrementing by one on every second. This allows you to see if you're missing any messages. The next two tags uh, represent the actual sensor data being collected by the boss unit. You have the uh, humidity and the, the light sensor value. It's sometimes fun to see whether or not these tag values are, are updating in real time. So I'm just going to put my hand over the light sensor. You can see that the value of the light sensor has gone to zero. And as I remove my hand, the value returns to the ambient light value. 
from KEPServer, now that these values are updating in real time, you can then share this data or make it available to various client applications. Whether that's an advanced analytics platform to take this data, to turn it into uh, conclusions to make better business decisions, or maybe this value represents a fail condition where you need to uh, take action to mitigate that failure. That concludes the demonstration for today. I hope you found it useful for you and uh, you can use it for a resource moving forward in future projects. If you have any questions about this demonstration or your Yukon configuration done in the future, feel free to contact us. Here are some resources for you. Um, the first two uh, links provided is uh, a Yukon blog uh, created by me on, on HTTP GET request through our Yukon driver. In addition to the blog post, we actually have a project template that will, will get you started on your HTTP GET from Yukon. Um, in addition, you can um, send any training requests to the third link provided, and also a link to other webinars and videos and demonstrations that we've con conducted here at Kepware. In addition, feel free to take a look at the upcoming webinars and events that are on the schedule. Again, thank you for watching today. Uh, my name is Brent Doobie. Uh, here is the Kepware contact information. If you have any questions about anything um, in the future, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.